Welcome to an all new episode of Holdsworthy Live. This episode may be a bit of a disappointment for some of you. Firstly, because it came after for such a long time, but I was moving houses and now I'm finally moved to a shithole known as Dulwich Hill, where I think if I walk barefoot, I will become Ant Man because of all the industrial toxic waste. Um, but other than that, that's not the disappointing bit of this video. The disappointing bit of this video would be the fact that um, if there's one thing that Jordan has taught me about making YouTube videos is that your title needs to be clickbaity. Just follow the Young Turks. The problem is my videos or the topics that I'm interested in aren't usually that clickbaity. So if I titled this video Nationalism and Self-Identity, I bet maybe five of you would click on it. So I named it what it is now. But I will tie um, why ethnics get triggered by non-PC stuff towards the end of this video. So, the story begins in around the 18th, around the 18th century, when the idea of nationalism essentially was just blooming or coming into formation. Nationalism can be defined in several ways. My um, definition of it is it in nationalism is is some is an idea that entails you to give a shit about people that you don't know that's probably the best way to describe it um, because essentially since like around 70,000 years ago when we've been living in tribal societies most of the people that were part of your um, that were part of your network essentially or these social structures that we had just started to develop were from people that you knew they were part they were part of your kin they were like your, essentially your blood relatives you shared a lot of things with them and part of that was that anyone that wasn't part of that tribe was alien and potentially dangerous it's almost in, encoded in our uh, evolutionary DNA to be essentially I'm saying xenophobia is sort of in our DNA so when this idea of nationalism started to bloom for the first time the states expected the citizenry to care about people that they didn't know Mo I don't know most Australians no one really does um, most of the countries that you live in, or any wherever you're living, you just don't know. You, most people don't even know their neighbors anymore, right? But somehow, every year, we give a large sum of money to the government as taxes to care for people that we have no clue about. This is this was this would have been considered. Um, I mean, there were always taxes, but to, but to formulate the purpose of taxation in this way is, is a very new concept. Taxes essentially were considered state oppression for the longest time. Essentially, the state taxed you a certain amount of money, or not even the state, sorry. Usually the ruler taxed you a certain amount of money, and there was just no way to avoid it. There was no justification as to why these taxes usually, why why, why the, the peasantry is forced upon to pay these taxes until the idea of nationalism when, you know, the, the claim is that, or and, and rightly so, that your taxes are paid to build hospitals in remote areas uh, for people that you have no clue about. And somehow we're supposed to be okay with it this story was developed the, the story of nationalism because it's it's extremely effective for nation building and state building you could argue that the the states that we live in now these advanced states are because of this idea it's also known as the social contract where you have a contract with the state that you will give up some of your own liberties for a greater good of for everyone around you 
Now, the key is everyone that is living within this nation state structure, anyone outside of that, very similar to tribalism, are dangerous. Now, this has worked insanely well, and in fact, most of the third world states that are developing, the way they build or the template for development is through the idea of nationalism. Now, the problem is around the 20th century, and certainly in the 21st century, mass migration has caused a lot of stress on this idea. This ex is saying this extremely, at, at this point, penetrative idea of who we are. And it often depends, or, or, as I said, where you live, the geography that you live, how you look, what cultural values you share amongst your fellow uh, nationhood. And during these mass migrations, after these mass migrations, this idea was extremely challenged because the idea of who you are is not just what you are, but what you're not as well. The fact that if you're English, what's extremely important is sure, you might like fish and chips and everything, but you're not French. That is an extremely important aspect of your own national identity. Um, and it's and certainly not African. Most of the, uh, or African, Asian, like the further you go, the more dangerous it sort of gets. People have fought wars over this, right? To protect your idea of nationhood. With these mass migrations, this idea is coming increasingly under stress. Now, most of the people that immigrate or emigrate and eventually immigrate into the first world, so for example, Australia, most of the people that come in, they are somewhat, um, they understand that, um, that obviously you're going into a new country and, and, and they somehow never ever give up their old national affiliation. I'm not necessarily saying that's a bad thing that they're traitors or anything, but um, but they 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 remain in in uh, they remain connected to it. So if you look at most of the houses, if you see a satellite on top of the house, it's most likely an immigrant's house because that is their way of keeping in connect. Well, maybe this is like an old example because it's like YouTube and everything. Most people are just watching it online. But satellites were a good indication of an immigrant household because that was their way of keeping in touch with what's considered the homeland. Now, the problem with their kids is, or the first generation, that they are in a complete fix. They they somehow uh, obviously are conflicted between these these two national identities what 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 is their peer national uh, social sorry social identity accompanied by national identity? what is their peers social identity and what is considered to be their own national identity or where or what their parents follow they most often would often they look different which is again a very exclusionary aspect of nationhood because what makes you again English is part of being white, is partly being white. And anyone that is not that is, uh, uh, it, there's a whole lot of questions that are raised by it. Like John Howard, for instance, said that, well, he wasn't comfortable with the idea of multiculturalism. He said that this does not conflict with multiracialism because you could be of any race as long as the culture that you follow is is a homogenized Australian culture. Now the problem with that is is that these particularly most of the the first and the first immigrants don't really they're, they're not really like confused about it. They know that obviously politicians are going to say these sorts of stuff, but they somehow can manage it because the whole journey of emigrating itself was such a such a crucial event in their life that they've come to terms with these sort of struggles that they will face. But the but the the children that are born uh, haven't come to terms with it. In fact, in most cases, never really do. 
um, so these ideas of so for example like okay fine so if I'm if I'm not white according to John Howard I'm fine but what about the idea that the the culture that I was raised in or what I see at my home is somehow not acceptable in the wider society and 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 look the it is an understandable effort by nationalists to try to preserve it because obviously it has led to immense good and just to get throw it all away would be rather disastrous as well but that does not help the kid that is coming to terms with these identity issues so often at times if for instance a a, a guy a, a, I don't know like a Lebanese kid or a brown kid or a black kid that was born in Australia is asked hey where, where, where are you from now that in itself is a harmless question if you ask me I don't care I say I'm from Pakistan because first of all I actually am from there like I literally made a journey although it was my childhood or whatever but I still made a journey so I don't I don't like particularly struggle with this idea but if I was born here maybe it would have been different maybe I would have felt that I, I you're asking me this question as if I am supposed to have an answer of where I'm from whereas like I was uh, that that world is, e is is extremely alien to me and these sort of questions make me feel that somehow I have to think about where I'm from so this is now this is it's it's a harmless question the guy isn't trying to offend you if offend you or anything but this is like so, okay so the best way to describe it when i was around 18 years old i was grappling with the idea of like if god exists or god doesn't exist and part of the grappling with this idea of if he does or if, if god doesn't exist was me trying to convince everyone that i met that god doesn't exist what i was essentially doing was not convincing them but convincing myself now that I'm much older and I've come to terms with the idea or my atheism in general I actually don't care if someone believes in God like I'm I'm like okay because I'm not really insecure about that anymore and it's the same goes for like these ethnic kids and often and this struggle is extremely pronounced in in children that are that have uh mixed racial ancestry so i had a friend who uh is known on the podcast as the dome king who's essentially a halfy as in his 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 mum was japanese and his dad was aussie and 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 it was and and i've i've sort of like uh i i used to ask him a lot of questions about coming to terms with that and and, it, and i've noticed that that one aspect of his life has sort of has sort of fucked him up because he has never been able to define himself because of the struggle and and I remember talking to him because he's also Jordan's or Jordan used to be best friends with him as well and I would ask Jordan and I would like sort of try to discuss this with him and Jordan was always not sympathetic because he would say it's useless if you're a mixed race you're smarter you're hotter what's why are you what are you complaining about and he's right because obviously if your genetic pool is much larger you're more likely to be smarter and you're more likely to be good looking as well so he thinks it's a win-win I don't understand why anyone but but I sort of understood because I've seen I've seen those slight struggles like even the fact that I just just now said um his mom's Japanese and his dad's Aussie as if saying that Aussie equals white now even I because these are such accepted facts but this in itself could make someone who was born over here and 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 but not a white but not of uh, of, of of the white skin color be extremely flustered about the fact that he could never be Aussie when Aussie is the only thing that he's ever witnessed I don't know I'm what I'm saying is that it's oh, also yeah I'm wearing a Pooh Bear shirt um what I'm saying is um I'm, I'm not necessarily arguing that what one should say or what one shouldn't say I'm just trying to in what I think 
trying to put into perspective of why these reactions occur. What I do have an opinion of, and I've sort of mentioned this on the pod a few times as well, that there's two essential models to a simulation of of migrants, of people that were traditionally not considered part of the nationhood to be part of the nationhood. One of the models is the European model, which is which is somewhat what Australia follows. Essentially that there needs to be homogenous culture, there needs to be a homogenous race almost, uh, and that's what makes you part of the nation. The other model is the American model because it was the whole the whole country in itself is formed by immigrants. What makes you American is not necessarily where you come from or what you look like, but your belief in certain civic duties. If you, if you, and that's why they have no problems with like hyphenation. So you can be Latino American, you can be African Americans have been living there for so long and are still considered and are still said to be African Americans. And no one has any problems with that. No one says, well, if you're, are you African or are you American? Because it's just, because that's not what makes you American. What makes you American is, is the idea of, believing in uh like you know the pursuit of happiness or the constitution or thinking that benjamin franklin was mad if you believe that you're an american no one cares what you look like so what i'm arguing for australia essentially is that we need to follow more of those models but more of the american model even though our ancestry, our history is more inclined towards the European model because the European model is in crisis. If you if you go to Europe, you'll realize how difficult a simulation has been for them. That's not the case in the U.S. and and thankfully has is not the case in Australia as well. But it can be, and it's and it's, it's slightly more than what the U.S. model is. So, um. Yeah, the title has been quite different to what the video is, but these have been just some of the ramblings. Um, and essentially, aside from inclusivity, um, what also needs to be considered is that what makes... So we, we don't have to blindly follow the U.S. model of certain civic duties what make you... An American. I think certain emancipatory um, achievements that we have can make us Australian. So I always argue that instead of um, having Anzac Day as something that makes us Australian, and, and and don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to say that the Anzac Day it's 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 a valiant effort and everything, but it inc- excludes people that don't have an ancestral connection to it, right? Um, if, you, if we can make things like Medicare, like the fact that every Australian thinks Medicare is mad can be a glue that can make us Australian. So what makes you Australian is you thinking that Medicare is mad. Or, or the, or, or it could, it could be anything, you know, like uh, our education system or some, some of the stuff that most of the country thinks is really really cool and that could be the binding force anyways this video is too long but thanks for tuning in and hopefully i'll see you next week bye